Good evening, everyone. My name is Captain Holly Weaver, and I'm coming to you from Kansas City. And I am so excited to have all of you here tonight because we have an amazing live stream. And um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my co-host, Captain Parham, and then we will kind of get these get this kicked off. Hey, Holly. How are you? Hey, how are you doing, boss? <laughs> I'm good. Just got to Peoria, settling in in the hotel. Nice little three-hour drive across the Midwestern states. Awesome. Well, we're glad that you made it safe with this winter weather, but are you just totally pumped up right now? We are going to be discussing the Health Profession Scholarship Program and just what it's like to be a resident and an intern in the Army. I actually am super excited about this show, um, and this one kind of holds a little near and dear to my heart. We can get into that here in a few minutes. But uh, yeah, I think this is a great opportunity to highlight a couple of different aspects of um, medical school life on HPSP and resident life um, after HPSP uh, and medical school. So um, I am really pumped about this. Well, awesome. Well, without further ado, let's let's do it. Here we go. Awesome. That intro just amps me up every time. I tell you what. It does. I played it earlier and and uh, our guests were like, that. that's intense. I said, Holly made it. Uh, I was super impressed when she showed it to me for the first time. It was some easy software to use. I, I can't take that much credit. Um, but it is just gets you in the mood, you know, to talk about army medicine and all of the opportunities. So I think this will be a great point for you to kind of tell us the personal connection and introduce our first guest. Yeah, absolutely. So our first guest today is going to be second Lieutenant Esther Gilbert. And as I stated before, kind of near to near and dear to my heart, she was the first HPSP applicant that um, I helped get into HPSP back in St. Louis in 2018, uh, wow. actually. Yeah. So she is a third year med student now, and her and I have kept in, in contact. Um, so I think that she has a lot to say about the training that she's gone through in med school. Um, and, and to date, honestly, she's been the best HPSP that I, I have worked with, um, the best applicant. She has a great, a great bio. Um, so she is she was born and raised in a military family um she's uh a, trying to read from here actually tell you what let me just pull her on here and she can tell you about her bio Hi. Hi, my name is Esther. I'm so happy to be here. So um, as Captain Parham mentioned, um, we go way back and um, I'm currently a third year medical student at St. Louis University School of Medicine. Um, I have been in St. Louis for the last several years now. I went to um, St. Louis University for undergrad as well. And um, I have plans to pursue general surgery next year. Thank you. Yes, sir. It's so great to see you. Happy to be here. Awesome. And our other guest that we would like to introduce is Captain Moulter. Um, she is a medical doctor. She went through issues. And let me just pull up her bio really quick, and I can tell you a little bit more about her. She is currently a pediatric intern at the National Cap Capital Consortium um, Pediatrics located at Walter Reed National Medical Center. She graduated from USU School of Medicine in 2021. And prior to commissioning, she was an Army medic for seven years. So her experience um, as a medic, I'm sure, is carrying over and, um, you know, just all of that medical and previous Army knowledge. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Maryland and spent two work years working in the field of child behavioral intervention as a teacher's assistant. And um, she was also a brigade medic for the 212 in Fort Bliss and has earned her expert field med medical badge as well as her German Armed Forces badge for med military proficiency. 
She has her MBA from the University of Maryland, and um, she played for the Fort Bliss women's varsity softball team. So that's something that's pretty cool, too, talking about the total soldier concept. Um, she also um, was a treatment NCO and now resides in Silver Spring, Maryland, with her husband and her six-year-old son. And she is currently serving as the American Academy of Pediatrics Section on Pediatric Trainees Liaison to the Section of the Uniform Services. And she is also on the Pediatric DEI Committee and co-wrote and impl implemented a cultural change in medical curriculum at UCHUS. So that is really cool, and we definitely want to hear more about that. So without further ado, go ahead and bring Dr. Moulter on the screen. Hi, how is everybody? We are great. How are you, ma'am? Good. I'm really happy to be here. Um, thank you for the just like wonderful and uh, <laughs> really shines a nice light on me <laughs> intro. You're very welcome. You definitely have a very impressive bio. Both of you do. Lieutenant Gilbert, you've accomplished so much already. Um, so, you know, you are great SMEs to be having on this live stream. So I think, um, you know, just to kind of get kick things kicked off, we're going to kind of just ask different questions. And some of them are going to be directly related to HPSP. And some of them will be more along the lines of what it's like to be a resident and an intern and just life in the military. And you have, you know, different experiences on that. Um, but first, we're going to kind of discuss what the HPSP scholarship is and, um, you know, just shine a light on that because not, you know, some people don't even know what HPSP stands for or what it is. So we're going to let Captain Parham give us an overview on what HPSP is and what all it entails. Yeah, so HPSP, the Health Professional Scholarship Program, and we do this not only for medical school, but also veterinary school, dental school, optometry school, clinical psychology, um, nurse practitioner, nurse anesthetist, uh, there's, there's so many, right? Um, and so the health professional scholarship covers 100% tuition, uh, reimbursement for all books, a $2,400 stipend monthly, um, and then for medical and dental school students, a $20,000 bonus in their first, first semester. So uh, when I first came out into recruiting, I had no idea about this. And I was, I was a medic for 10 years. And when I learned about this particular program, I was, my mind was just blown. That, uh, that, that this was out there and so many people didn't know about it. So in my opinion, I think that this is the greatest um, program that the Army has, has to offer. And so I am happy to be out here to help and um, lead our undergraduates and medical students into this program. Absolutely. I definitely agree. It is an amazing program for so many different areas. Today, we are focusing on our medical HPSP, but definitely if you are interested in dental or vet corps or um, CRNA, you can always reach out. My contact information is scrolling below. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, through texting or calling me, as well as my email. And I'll be happy to share all of the information that I have on any of those different programs. So I'd like to um, just kind of open it up and um, have both of our guests just kind of share why they decided to serve in the first place. So kind of just share your why I serve. We'll start with uh, Lieutenant Gilbert. Perfect. Um, so I come from a military family, as mentioned previously. Uh, my dad was um, an Air Force uh, general by the time that he retired. And um, I moved 10 times before starting high school. The military lifestyle was really ingrained in me. Uh, my two older siblings both went to academies and um, pursued the military life as well. So um, it wasn't necessarily my default by any means. Um, I wasn't just following the family business. It's something that um, I grew up loving. I have always wanted to serve. It's something that I feel like is a part of me and um, something that I would like to continue as a physician. It was um, a marriage of my two loves, uh, the love of medicine and the love of serving my country and my community. Um, 
and the HPSP program allowed me to do that without incurring all of this debt. Um, and they have really supported me through the last several years of medical school, both um, financially um, and just providing a community. Hey, stop pushing buttons when I'm pushing buttons. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and uh, we, we can go over, over the to, uh, we can go over like Captain Wilker, um, even though I think she might be playing video games on Twitch over there. I'll pause them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, um, my story is like, so, uh, I feel like very different from, um, Esther's. I actually, there's like no military in my family. Um, there's actually really no medical uh, professionals in my family either. So where I came from is kind of a mystery. Um, I, I saw the military as a couple of things. I thought that the kind of structure and the system behind it would be a good place for me. I thought that it would um, be something that I would thrive in an environment that I would really enjoy. And so I actually enlisted first. Um, uh, along with those lines, I always knew I wanted to do medicine, and uh, I thought that medicine in the military might be like really where it was at for me. And honestly, being able to pay for it, being able to see that like um, those costs covered was a huge thing for me coming from um, like kind of our resources as a family. And I joined, um, I re upped twice, so I obviously did not hate it. Um, I, I served as a medic and I uh, honestly just kept working and wanted to get to medical school. And so I've kept going um, and there's always been ups and downs, but throughout it, I've really found a way to practice medicine and have the camaraderie that I, um, that I, I really didn't know that I wanted in my life, but it's been a big part of it. I think that's awesome. Uh, I mean, coming, I was a medic as well for 10 years. But seeing you progress from being at that level, you know, the combat medicine side and then moving into where you're at now through medical school, I think is is really great. And Esther, you have a wonderful story. And if I remember correctly, your dad commissioned you on your graduation day, right? It was my birthday, my graduation, and my dad commissioned me all in one day. So Wow, was, that's um, awesome. Yes, it was wonderful to have that experience. Definitely a day you will not soon forget. Absolutely not. So um, thank you both so much for sharing why you serve. I think it's really great for us to just kind of understand your backgrounds. And Captain Moulter, I think it's especially, especially inspiring to our currently serving or former service members who are thinking, that maybe medical school is out of reach, but it's not out of reach and is attainable. And we're here to get you the tools to um, help you apply as well as provide a scholarship through the Health Profession Scholarship Program and, um, you know, make your dreams come true. And I really, you went through the Uniformed Services University route, which is an option, but the Health Profession Scholarship Program would allow um, the individual who goes to medical school, they get to go to their medical school of choice. Um, so they're, um, you know, more like a civilian while attending medical school. In the U.S. In the U.S. That's correct. And accredited. And accredited. So it can't just be, you know, Joe's School of Medicine. It's got to be an accredited medical school. MD or DO is good to go. Awesome. So, um I would like to hear from Esther, and um, if you could please just share um, what is what kind of drew you to HPSP. We know that you have a family background of serving in the military, and and that. Um, but what was what were the specific benefits that you saw with the HPSP program that kind of enticed you to apply? So similar to Dr. Moulter, I am the first person in my family to pursue medicine. So I was going into the application process very blind. And part of what drew me to the HPSP program is knowing that I would be able to serve was a huge um, part of what drew me to this program. Additionally, um, it was actually past experiences with physicians 
who, um, as a child, I went to a pediatrician who was in the military and um, they were HPSP graduates. And uh, that was something that my parents had known about and they encouraged me to pursue this option. And through suturing clinics that have been sponsored by the military, uh, different events, and then of course my encounters um, with Captain Parham, it was something that I realized would give me the independence to pursue what I want, how I want with the support of the military. That's awesome to hear you mention the suture clinics because that is something that we put a lot of emphasis on. It's helping out our pre-med societies, um, different, you know, PA um, groups, you know, just all these different clubs and schools with doing suture clinics and intubation clinics and stop the bleeds. So we really like to see um, that, you know, there is a payoff from that um, just because, you know, we're building those relationships, we're offering our skill set. Um, and then, you know, seeing that people get excited about the Army and what it would be like to serve in Army medicine from our interactions, that is definitely a rewarding feeling. And obviously, Captain Parham, you know, is, he's like, a, he's a proud recruiter, being that you have already been so successful. And I definitely have the same feeling um, with all of my recruits that I've helped put in, you know, you seeing them in the mil in the army and um, just all the amazing things that they're doing. And you know that um, Brandon and I, we know that we were at the beginning of their journey. We were like in the first chapter of their book, their army story. So that's really cool. So thank you so much for sharing that. And we actually have, go ahead, Brandon. I got something for you. Yeah. And so just to go back to the suture clinics, I would, that's my favorite thing to do because it's so much interaction and it's so awesome to see the med students get, get really excited about being able to, to do the sutures and, and everything. Um, so I really enjoy those and Esther really helped set a lot of those up and, and just, uh, you know, get the information out there. She's been an integral part in St. Louis too. So I appreciate you and, Absolutely. I'm so, yeah, I'm so happy to see, still be in contact with you and, and see how well you're doing. So no, thank you, Ollie. Like I said, yeah. my parents planted the seed and you really helped it grow. And, you know, then it came full circle with first you teaching me how to suture and introducing me. And now I love helping out with suturing clinics and helping to organize them around. So I think that's a great, great story of just how you know, now you are paying it forward. So I think that's really awesome. We actually have had really good viewership thus far of our live stream. Right now we are live on our Battalion Facebook, YouTube page, as well as I have it streaming to my LinkedIn. That's a new feature um, that LinkedIn allows. So it, we are getting quite a few comments and viewership from LinkedIn. So that's great. We're going to pull up a few of these comments. Um, it looks like that you guys have some super fans out there that are tuned in um, and want to kind of give you some shout outs. So our first um, comment is from Deja. I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, she is super pumped about this live stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are super pumped as well. Don't know if you can tell, but we are amped. We love talking Army Medicine and we love talking about our um, awesome programs, especially HPSP. You said we're super amped. <laughs> yeah, we are. All Can we get some friends. emphasis on super amped? Amped. We're amped up. Well, see, Thanks. see, I was trying to say, though, my favorite part of Esther's story was that uh, she talked about the pediatricians. And uh, I just want to say that that makes that really pumps me up because um, that is the best specialty in the army. So I just want to throw that out there for you. You are one of my parents' favorite stories. Oh, sorry. <laughs> No, no, you're good. I, I, I was just saying, you guys are taking take, taking care of the next generation. That's important. It's it all, is. It's all no, it's such an inspiration. Absolutely. Um, but one of the favorite stories that my parents love to tell is that when we were little, we would always go, as I mentioned, to these army physicians. And um, my brother, who's four years my senior, one day turned to my mom and he said, 
mommy, can boys be doctors too? And it was because all of our pediatricians just happened to be female. But, um, you know, she loves telling that story of how we had such fantastic um, female pediatricians as role models as kids. So that's awesome. That is awesome. That is definitely my experience as well. <laughs> all right, we're going to go through a few more of these comments. We have a comment from Gregory just doing a shout out. And then we have another comment from a Patrick saying, Captain Moulter is an amazing warrior and doctor. We think so too. And we are super glad that both Captain Moulter and Lieutenant Gilbert agreed to come on our show with us because no one really wants to just see Brandon and I. They want to see our, our guests that we bring on. Absolutely. All right. And um this is another comment from gregory he says good to see you dr Moulter. greetings from dr sharney so nice little shout out there and we actually have our first question so I'll go ahead and bring that up on screen and this is from courtney and she asks um dr Moulter, how was the transition from being an army medic to a physician do you feel it gave you a better outlook and appreciation for your commissioning uh, yes, in a simple answer. Um, I It has grounded me a bunch in uh, making the transition over to physician. I think that I it's really helped me see a lot of different layers when it comes to doctoring and, and being able to see kind of the whole patient and um, what we need to do to take care of them. It also helps a ton to be able to know that army side and have lived that army side and know what it's like to be tasked for things, be on missions, need to get permission from, you know, your squad leader, your first sergeant, things of that nature. And, and to help our patients or the parents of our patients in um, a lot of my cases, be able to navigate that system. So I think that absolutely it gave me a great appreciation for uh, the total army and how to help everybody that's serving. Awesome. Yeah. That's a great I, I kind of want to touch on that. And I, I think I think that's awesome because you have seen the lower levels and as a medic, typically work directly with a physician assistant. Um, and, you know, you, you don't get a whole lot of interaction with with the physicians. But um, being like you said, being able to see those layers of all the way from the bottom to where you're at now. Yeah, it's, I, I can imagine. That it's, it's, uh, it's been a really cool experience honestly it's um it's a little surreal I, <laughs> uh, I i was mostly in operational units and so now being in the hospital and seeing um, hospital medics and corpsmen is um is a different kind of outlook but it really again like it's get to see like the whole thing um which i always love being able to see more of the whole picture absolutely all right it looks like our next comment um, is just asking um, if you guys would be willing to share your contact info. I believe um, that Miss Nicholas is interested in applying um, from some of her other comments, maybe. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Go ahead and put that in the chat if you are potentially applying, Miss Nicholas. Um, but if you guys would be willing, then you can um, give me your contact. Well, I have your contact information if you're if you're willing that I can share your contact um, information with Ms. Nicholas. Absolutely. Congratulations on applying, if that's your, your plan. All right. So next comment we have, I'm a prior service and really want to apply. I can't seem to get over a 500 in MCAT. Any recommendations for studying to get a higher score? How much is the MCAT weighted in an application? I will let Captain Parham answer this question. So, so it is weighted. Um, to a certain extent, but when we come to the the whole application, it's not just the MCAT. Um, we do have MAC waivers or minimal application criteria that uh, we can do waivers for. So it it depends on. It sounds like um, the five hundred piece. I'm not sure what your line scores are, but if it's if it's the five hundred, you're at a four ninety eight or four ninety nine. I would say definitely reach out to us um, and let us help you. Uh, we can look at your scores overall, but we also have the HPSP application, which has your statement of motivation. That's your chance to speak directly to the board and um, tell them what you're all about and 
tell them about your past experiences, your volunteerism, all these other things and awards, uh, scholarships that you have attained through your career in undergrad and, and whatever degrees that you've done, um, as well as your letters of recommendation and allowing them to speak for you as well. So it it's not necessarily just about the MCAT score. Um, it The board does take the whole person, especially with you being prior service. Um, the board looks on that very, very highly as you already have the desire and will and um, determination to serve. So I would say reach out to Holly. Her contact information is there at the bottom and we can we can chat and uh, hopefully get you get you on the application. I would also like to um, kick this back to our panel members on recommendations for how to study and what enabled the both of you to be successful. Hey, so um, while, while you answer that, I'm going to show this. Um, so there is free study material and then I'll, I'll let um, the two, one potential doctor or upcoming doctor and current doctor kind of touch on their their MCAT studies. But the Army does have the march to success dot com where you where they do have free study material, free test prep and um, free tests that you can use uh, to to help you with your MCAT. So I'll let one of one of wants to go first. I can jump in. So, um, Melinda, with full disclosure, I am not a strong test taker. So, um, when approaching the MCAT, I also had some difficulty. And what I would recommend for studying techniques is the MCAT is, I believe, one of the first exams that you take that are not brute memorization. They're far more a thinking challenge, um, as well as a marathon in the sense that it's a very long, it's a very challenging, it's a very grueling exam. So my study recommendation would be practice, 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 and then practice some more. So really getting in a test simulation environment. So maybe going to your local library or finding a quiet room in your house or um, somewhere in your community where you can sit down for one hour then two hours, then three hours, and really building up that endurance so that when you get to the test, you can sit through it with some confidence and know how to work through questions instead of just focusing on the brute memorization because the amount of information that's on the MCAT can be very, very overwhelming. So focusing less on that portion and more on the logic, working your, um, your way through that, if that makes sense. Don't yeah, stop pushing buttons when I push buttons. <laughs> I won't push them anymore. So I pulled up the comment from Colonel Ha, our battalion commander. Thank you for tuning in, sir. Um, and he wanted to share that there are minimum criteria for MCAT sports, but the board is looking at the total person concept. So um, they're looking at what you're involved in in your community, your commitment to service, your statement of motivation, letters of recommendations, and your GPA, and taking all of those things into consideration because you can't just be strong in one area. You need to be a balanced, a balanced applicant. So that way we know that you're going to be a great leader and a great officer and a great doctor. Captain Moulter, do you have any additional recommendations for studying for the MCAT? Um, I mean, I would definitely echo uh, what Esther said, the the sheer test taking of just like sitting through that long of, um, of a test and having those time hacks is definitely something that you just have to like prep for. Um, the thing that I did and I think was um, because it was difficult being on active duty, being like a new mom and trying to do it was um, I, I used a lot of free resources. Um, I used Khan Academy. They have a MCAT prep. Um, I felt that it got me to a good enough place um, and realizing that I was never going to be a person that got like the absolutely like exceptional MCAT. And that was OK because I had other things in my um, in my application that made me a good candidate. and. Thankfully, somebody agreed. Um, but 
getting to like just that point of, okay, I feel comfortable enough with this. And then doing practice tests, like she was said, like doing, you know, doing a four hour chunk of time of actually doing like the whole, like a half test or doing a whole test um, is, is really worth it. It's not fun, but, um, but it, but it definitely helps. Thank you for that. And I, I do want to also throw in here that um, Altius is something new that I've, I've seen and I saw it. Hey, did you have some? Oh yeah, no, those, so that's, yep. Those are the tests that I used and this, it's simulated just like them. They're for test prep materials. They are probably one of the more affordable, um, which is also often a consideration. And so I, I use those as well. So definitely echo that. Awesome, thank you. So Melinda, definitely look into uh, March to Success for that study material. Um, you can take into consideration what what Esther and and uh, Captain Walter said. It's and then the Altius. Uh, I've heard really really great things about that and the way that they prep you for the tests and run you through the whole scenario and everything like that. Um, a little bit stress free, so that way you can kind of get those get over those nerves. Yeah. All right, it looks like our next question from Captain Nicholas. She put in the chat that she's a Captain Anonymous. So thank you so much for letting me know about that. Um, she wants our panel members to share the differences between the freedom and flexibility of attending USUs versus the civilian medical school. Um, so since we have uh, both of our panel members from different backgrounds, um, Captain I want to clear this up right now. Yeah, I want to clear this up right now. Usus or you shoes? Thank you. Okay. Usus. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I, I stand corrected. It, I hear I hear uses or you shoes all the time, and I was tons of people a, say it. I was corrected at a conference with the uses. Usus. So. Usus. <laughs> all right, I'm good to go. Usus. All right, so we'll let the both of you um, just kind of share your perspective on the differences. Um, you know, Captain Moulter, um, did you know about HPSP? Were you just planning to always do uses? Um, for me personally, my my goal was to do uses, and that had a lot to do with. Um, my my family and my financial planning um i'm originally from maryland and so it was also like me being able to come home um which was a big draw i my son was two when i started medical school and so i very much wanted to come back to kind of a more local area where i had a lot of support for that time um it's i mean differences wise there's there's the stipend for HPSP uses does have the advantage of like being an active duty um, officer and so you get like all of the the salary for that but you're also an active duty officer so there are your your commitment and your um, uh, your requirements start from day one at uses versus sort of like being a civilian during medical school and then coming on to residency and we do a longer time so we owe um, seven years um, versus i believe it's three or four depending on how long how many years you do the hpsp scholarship yep correct and oh i she's i think esther's on a call so we'll we'll wait a second um, and I, I kind of wanted to touch on, on that with the uh, difference between the time commitment. Yes, yeah, so it is it is one for one when you're on HPSP. Um, so if it's a three year scholarship, you go three years afterwards, depending on your residency. All right. So um, and then, as you stated, seven years. However, one of the cool things that the Army does is if, if you go to USIS and then retire on USIS, um, so you, you retire 20 years and then you'll get 24 years of pay as retirement for going through uses, whereas on HPSP, um, with that shortened time length, if you transition to the reserve after your active duty service obligation or add, so you, um, are able to gain back those years toward, uh, retirement as well. So they'll, they'll count them as reserve time. So kind of different incentives for each each one. And it looks like Esther's back, so I'll bring 
her back on. Hi, thanks so much for being patient. It just goes to show that nothing can go off without some hitch happening. So um, everything that um, Dr. Mulcher said was accurate. So the perks of being at um, USIS, if I said that correctly, um, is that you do have that, um, you do have the benefit of the salary, but you also then are active duty um, that entire time. So I had the benefit of being at a civilian medical school, but um, then I had a reserve salary and then reserve um, accommodations, I guess is the correct term. So because of that, um, it was really important for me to be at a civilian institution. I was part of an early acceptance program through the um, St. Louis University um, undergrad program. And um, I apologize. <laughs> um, so um, that was something that I benefited from. And as Dr. Or, um, excuse me, Captain Parr mentioned, it also has, it comes with different commitments. And so that was a commitment that I was willing to accept being on the four year scholarship program. Did I answer the questions fully? Yes, yep. absolutely. Holly. Perfect. Holly, is it you? What? what? Do what? Can you hear me? Yeah, what is going on? What What's happening? Everything looks fine to me. Yeah, what's happening yeah, in your own farm? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do you, not, do you not see anything? No. Did your Another opportunity going? to adapt and overcome. Yep. <laughs> well, we'll just keep rolling. I'm not sure what technical issues Captain Parham is facing right now, but that's okay. Um, we have a lot more questions coming through and comments, so we'll pull those up. Another one from Captain Nicholas. She is interested to know the competitive stats for MD MDO matriculation awarding an HPSP scholarship. That's something I'm not sure. Um, I personally don't have that data, but I can definitely ask to see if that data is available. Um, you know, if that's something that's tracked. I'm back. Okay. Did you figure your uh, situation out? Yeah. What, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so apparently you guys can hear this, but on my, on my earphones, in the background, on my other browser, the show I was watching last night just decided <laughs> to kick on and it was, it was, uh, There is never Christmas a dull music. moment with him. Yeah. <laughs> imagine, um, it, okay, imagine having him as a boss. This happens all the time. <laughs> so I was working, I was watching this... Workaholics, and in the background, it's like, blah, 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 and they're like singing Deck the Halls. And so I'm like, Holly, what is going on? Like, I know that you like Christmas and you have your Christmas tree up at all times in the year, but like, what, why are you playing this music? But I was the only one that could hear. <laughs> Okay. We're, do you know, um, we're going to reel you back in. We're going to reel you back in. <laughs> do you know if there are stats for this question, um, the MDDO matriculation awarding HPSP scholarship, or do you know if we can find that out? Because I personally don't know this information, but. So I don't have specific, I don't have specific stats. However, um, the Army does not discriminate with MD or DO. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, we have a lot of DO selected and we have a lot of MD. It's, as we stated before, it's, it's not based upon, it's not based upon the school. It's based upon the whole person concept. And um, a lot of times, and even in, in Esther's case, uh, what we like to do is before you even have a letter of acceptance, you can apply for the scholarship, be accepted to a scholarship, right? So in Esther's case, she was, she applied between her junior and senior year, um, had not been accepted to SLU Med yet, uh, but was able to go into those interviews with, with the selection of being on the scholarship and bring that, bring that piece to the scholar or bring that to the, the interviews, right? So I'm still messed up with the, the 
Um, but we'll, we'll okay, I, know, I know how you feel. So, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it, it doesn't really have much to do with the DO or MD. And I just pulled up our next cap, uh, comment from Captain Nicholas because she was wanting to know about the letter of acceptance. So I'm really glad you touched on that because that is a big misnomer that people it, think it is. That they think it, they already yeah, have to be right. accepted. And they don't because we actually want to start working with you prior to that um, because then that way, you know, you're going to get your stipend at an earlier time. You know, it's, you're not going to, you know, the payment to medical school is going to be happening like right when you start. Um, so that way you don't have to worry about a balance kind of thing and figuring out the finances. I mean, the money will come. It just could be delayed it, depending on when you apply. So applying for HPSP prior to getting your, your LOA from medical school is it's, it's really good. We, we yep. encourage it. And, and I want to touch on that. Actually, I was out at uh, Missouri university or Mizzou and I ran into somebody she just had an army water bottle so we went up and spoke to her hey are you in the army and she said no but i wanted i want to do hpsp uh, i spoke with somebody before they said i have to wait until i have a letter of acceptance it's like no that's absolutely not true we can do it we can put your application in prior to um so you can bring that to your interview process same as esther did so she started her senior year knowing that she had a um because SLU has a, a cool thing where they're able to move from uh, undergrad straight into the the SLU med and based off of their GPA and, and other things that I'm sure she could touch on. But, but she was able to move into her senior year of undergrad knowing that she had med school locked up and a scholarship locked up. And uh, she just really had to maintain and do what she had been doing. So it's a great opportunity to not have the letter of acceptance yet and bring that into the interview. Yeah. Big, mis big, big misconception. All right, we have another question from Staff Sergeant Aquino, and she wants to know, um, in your um, both of your opinions, uh, do the stipend and benefits that are provided with HPSP and USIS do they help enough while going to school with your finances? So let's start with uh, Captain Moulter. So from a useless standpoint, they absolutely did. Um, I, it's me, my husband and my, um, uh, my son and, um, my husband stays at home with our son. And so as the sole income and I did that on, um, the useless uh, salary, I guess it's, it's a second Lieutenant salary. And with my prior service and years time and grade, I absolutely was fine. I would absolutely agree. So even being on the reserve side, what happens is the HPSP program will cover your entire tuition and then any necessary school expenses. So things even as far as textbooks, stethoscopes, um, reflex hammer, all of those expenses are covered. And then in addition to that, you do get a monthly stipend and that stipend differs based on where you're located. So if you're in a high cost of living area, that stipend is reflected. So in St. Louis, the stipend is actually very generous. So in addition to covering my rent, my groceries, other cost of living, my gas for my car, uh, I still have money at the end of every month to put into savings. So I do feel like it is um, plenty to live on as a single woman. Awesome. So something I just want to like kind of touch on or clear up. So you speak, you spoke about um, on the reserve side. So um, technically you're in a reserve status while you're in school. Um, but then once you graduate, then you'll go on active duty to fulfill your commitment. So uh, my question for you is that wh while you're in school, what does your actual commitment to the Army look like of, you know, your summer breaks? Are you doing anything with the Army during that time frame? Absolutely. That's a great question. So during medical school, they are very invested in you being the best doctor that you can be. So for the most part, they, they pay for your education and they let you 
be a student. The exception to that is with your summer breaks. So the ideal is that you would be able to do trainings or a training, excuse me, every year. So they have recently combined um, two trainings into one larger training um, with the hope that students will be able to complete it during the summer between your first and second year. In my med school and many other med schools around the country, you don't really get summers after your first year. So um, in that sense, what they do is they do still provide you with a 45 days of active duty time every year. And that time is then just completed at your home institution. So for 45 days, you are getting active duty pay instead of reserve pay. But um, there is only, like I said, one training that um, is a now combo training that you hopefully will be able to complete during medical school or as an elective during your fourth year. If that isn't uh, possible, there is the opportunity to do that post-graduation, but then it might just delay your, your residency a, a tad. But they work with you, they work with your school, um, and if any exceptions or exemptions are necessary, they're very understanding. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's, um, so the, the DCC and, or, Direct commissioning course and the and the bullock basic officer order course is definitely a huge question that we that we typically get and then timeline for that. So thank you so much for touching on that. Um, and Captain Moulter, um, I'd like to ask you what your experience is when it comes to life in the army and being a resident at the same time. What your commitment to the army is, how you feel it would differ uh, on the civilian side compared to the Army side? Yeah, um, I think that for the most part, um, residency is primarily residency. There are the standards and regulations that you always have to uphold. Um, we have to complete our PT test, um, although that's a whole thing in the Army right now, it's probably all of you know with the ACFT. Um, but that like those requirements are definitely there outside of that there again are sort of like annual trainings that need to be completed but by and large we are residents and that's what we do i think honestly the biggest difference in that sense is that um, sometimes i need to be my uniform when i'm seeing patients and that's like just my you know what i wear in versus being in like kind of a business casual um and but otherwise, like patient care is really what they're there or there for and really there to learn. Um, and that's what they take seriously and uh, really direct everything towards um, in our I can really I mean, I can speak well to like my pediatric program, um, but I think it's reflective of a lot of the programs in the Army. We get a lot of opportunities to see some um, some interesting cases, some cases that come in from overseas, some different training, like different missions that come in. And so sometimes we get uh, the opportunity to see things that our civilian counterparts just simply don't have that opportunity, which is nice. And we're always trained to think about being a sole provider. So that is something that I think is a little different. We we talk about using our resources. Um, when we think about pediatrics, we talk about like our subspecialties and if we need to talk to the cardiologist or things like that. But then we also learn a lot more of, hey, you might be the only doc or the only pediatrician in this huge area because you're deployed or you're on a mission or you're in like kind of a, a you know, a middle of nowhere um, base and you need to be able to do all of this regardless of just being a general peds. So I think that aspect is a big thing that is taught maybe a little differently than some of our civilian counterparts. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple more questions. I want. I actually wanted to touch a little bit on matching. Um, so, and kind of hit both sides of this, right? So uh, Esther, can you just explain what you're doing now as HPSB to prepare for match? So other than stressing, I am um, <laughs> the HPSB program, depending on what specialty you are applying to, 
you could potentially do the military match or the military match as well as the civilian match. So with my hopes of going into general surgery, that is one of the programs that recommends that you, or one of the specialties that recommends that you apply to both sides. So at this time, what I have done is I have organized away rotations, so or audition rotations, so that I'm able to see the military facilities, participate with uh, staff, faculty, other HPSP and USIS students that will be my, my future colleagues. And um, those are typically scheduled around the summertime with the hopes of in the fall applying, having that interview season and then match in early to mid-December. Juggling that with the civilian side where their match is slightly later. So um, I will not be participating in any audition or away rotations for the civilian match, but still keeping in mind, um, gathering a personal statement, letters of intent, organizing letters of recommendation, all of those things are steps that I'm currently doing in February of my third year to prepare for that match. Yeah, and I definitely think that you're gonna get it. I think you're gonna get the- I thank you. <laughs> and, We're cheering and, you on. And, we are always and so you'll have to let me know definitely i will keep you posted um do you see any difference with your match process compared besides the timeline do you see any difference between your match process and uh, those that are not hpsb so the military often gets a hard time with being less efficient in some senses i've actually found the exact opposite so in the match process they have been incredibly eager to get students um, scheduled with audition rotations they've been very proactive with um, ensuring that students are aware of the timeline when it comes to dates as well as their expectations for letters of recommendation for their personal statement um, so it, it has been a surprisingly positive experience it's that's really great to hear it yeah. it is and you're not wrong <laughs> on <laughs> on some of the some of that um with the, the efficiency piece um captain Multer, can you oh dude do, do you want to hit this first no we can go to captain Multer and then we'll address that um so talking about the match just like being obviously done with that <laughs> <laughs> what that looks like on the other side. Um, I think one of the, the nicest things is that you're done a lot earlier. And so um, mine actually got delayed by about a month or so because of the whole, because of COVID. Um, but we still found out in January and that's still months before um, the civilians, my uh, civilian counterparts did. So having that knowledge and being able to prepare for my life of like where I'm going was absolutely wonderful um being in contact with my program and you know in contact with like what is my intern class is is lovely um and your stress decreases a whole ton after match i promise it will go back up when you start intern year but you have like a really golden like kind of six months um i don't frankly remember if there was more to add about match um it's uh, it's still, I think, the same as, as terms like ranking. Um, we rank on our side, they rank on their side. So I, I think the rest of it is fairly similar. That's awesome. The other thing that I wanted to add in too is on the civilian side, I think oftentimes they discriminate based on step scores, whereas the military, because there's fewer applicants for each spot, um, they tend to take a far more holistic approach. And this kind of jumps in to Justin's question here. So uh, step one, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a phenomenal test taker. Step one was a bit of a struggle for me. I actually had some personal issues that um, quite frankly, I was sick for almost six weeks. So, and that was leading up to my step one. Um, I was able to keep up academically and, and persevere through that, but step one didn't go quite according to plan for that reason. And step two is to be determined. So I'll be taking it in about uh, seven weeks. Awesome. Good luck with step two. We know Thank that you're you. going to do great. Thank you. And it looks like we have another captain uh, question from Captain Nicholas. And Captain Parm is going to answer this question for her on if HPSP awardees are in the USAR or IRR during medical school. 
Yep. So, and uh, HPSP is in the IRR technically while in medical school. And as I mentioned before, which is why if they do their active duty serv service obligation uh, and then transition to the reserve, the reserve will reward them with their uh, medical school time because they'll have 15. If you, if you were to look at the points sheet, they get 15 points. Um, and so that's kind of their incentive to go into the reserve if they don't stay on active duty. Awesome. Now it looks like we have one more question in our chat and then we will go into just closing comments about anything that we didn't touch on that you guys would like to share with our audience. Um, so we have this question from uh, Ms. Place, and she wants to know if students know what specialties are available ahead of applying, and are students provided with recommendations so for what they would like to match in? Is this talking about like ahead of match? Do they know? Yes. Ahead okay. Of match. Yeah, ahead of match, they're um, they'll put out like these are how many slots are available for um, for surgery, for pediatrics, for emergency medicine, those kinds of things, and then where um, those slots are located. So there are four slots at Walter Reed, there are eight slots at Tripler, those kinds of things. Um, so you do know that ahead of time, and that can obviously influence like how you rank and you know where you think about where you're going to go. Um, as as far as recommendations go, I think. Um, just in general, when you have your med school advisors, there there's a constant, um, at least from my experience, the availability of um, information about the match of, of mentors and also just advising on what do you want to go into? Like, you know, if it's a, a more competitive specialty, like what's let's look at your, you know, let's look at your application. Let's look at how we can kind of game plan things. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're asking, but um, I would say that there are recommendations, uh, but if there's something more specific to that, then I can try and answer. Hester, and what's your experience with that? I was just gonna add, um, if this is prior to starting medical school, particularly in the army, I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that most all specialties are available. It's not like one year OBGYN isn't going to be offered or one year they don't need any pediatricians. So the number of spots per each location might vary slightly each year, but you can count on particularly the large specialties existing regardless. Um, and then from a civilian side, I relied on my third year clerkships primarily, as well as recommendations from fourth year peers, academic mentors to kind of guide me towards my my specialty plan. And I would just say, absolutely, with before medical school, um, you're absolutely right. Like basically everything's available there. There may be different amounts of slots um, at every year, but those are also published each year for anybody to see. And so if you're, you know, you're thinking about going in, you can look at like last year's and the year before and see basically the trend of like, oh, there's this many slots in this specialty if you want to get an idea of roughly what there is. Yes, and your your local AMED um, recruiting NCO or officer should have that. Uh, I know I've sent it to Esther a couple of times prior to uh, HP or during HPS, HPSP and med school, so. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your input and advice on that. Um, I did think of one final question that I have for Dr. Moulter, and then we'll go into our closing remarks. Um, on your bio, it had that you were a member of the DEI um, committee and that you co-wrote and implemented a cultural change in medicine curriculum at um Uses a call to action students establish a cultural a bystander intervention early in medical training. And I just wondered if you could just share what that entailed and kind of like what that meant to you and just a little bit of background on that because I think that's really interesting and I think that's really great work that you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Um, it is one of my absolute favorite things to talk about. Um, equity and inclusion work is uh, a big passion of mine and uh, particularly when it comes to doing um, taking action and so in medical school myself and another um, 
another classmate who is actually also an intern at Walter Reed in a different specialty, but um, we we wanted to do a curriculum that focused a lot on how we as officers, as we become leaders, as we become um, you know physicians and just officership in general, how can we um, lead in situations that are difficult, that are sensitive, and really try and shape our environment to what it should be um, about speaking up when things need to be said, about addressing um, discrimination, addressing bias, addressing things like racism and sexism and things that um, unfortunately exist um, across the army just as it does across society and needs to be addressed. And um, we we're lucky to have an amazing mentor, um, Dr. Dana Wynn, who's the chair of the um, family med department at USIS, and she's been really instrumental. Um, they're peer they're peer led, so a class above would lead the class below and have um, what we received is most like very positive feedback of being able to have an open space to discuss these things, to um, talk about ways to actually handle this, um, discuss how to be an advocate as a medical officer. So as a special staff, when you're talking to commanders, how to be able to advocate for your patients um, and your soldiers. And, um, and then in our, our senior curriculum, we do like kind of a, a week long field exercise that incorporates all of the medicine, the military medicine things called Bushmaster. And we have some scenarios in there that, that involve um, addressing situations like this because they do arise often. And our hope is that it brought forth conversation. It gave people tools to be able to help and that um, it's still running. Uh, we, we had a team that we created and handed off to um, we keep a close eye on it because it's our baby, but uh, it's doing well. It's still thriving and they're very supportive at the school. So I hope, you know, it will continue to go um, and make a difference in that, um, in that realm. And um, I was, I, I, there's a great DEI committee at, um, at Walter Reed in the pediatrics department and uh, they've got phenomenal leaders. Um, uh, Dr. Brittany Fleming and um, NP Janice McGirt really lead our, um, our team in trying to, push similar uh, different curriculums and different um, lectures and our program director, um, Dr. Hepps is very receptive. And so it's just been a really good experience to be able to discuss these things in the army as they need to be discussed and as leaders and officers. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and for the work that you do are doing because it is definitely making a difference. So we appreciate you um, for sharing with us the work that you're doing out there. Absolutely. Um, thank you both so much for being here today and sharing your, your experiences and your timelines and all of the information. It's, it's really been helpful, um, not only for myself and I'm sure for Holly, um, for all of all the viewers. And uh, so just thank you again so much for, for sharing. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And as it was mentioned earlier, if anyone uh, reaches out to Captain Weaver, please feel free to give them my contact information. I would be happy to discuss Perfect. this further. Yeah, absolutely. This has been great. Um, I really enjoyed it. So thank you for having me. And uh, to echo Esther, you can absolutely pass along my information if anybody would like it. Awesome. Thank you both so much. This has been a fantastic hour and three minutes. We have had a great time um, just getting to know your Army stories and your experiences with medical school and with, um, you know, your internship. So we cannot thank you enough. And now we have, you know, I have a couple additional body, battle buddies. So I appreciate you all. And um with that, we will go ahead and sign off and wish everyone a great night. All right. Have a great night, everyone. And we'll see you Thank next you. time.